Okay, so we're going to have the reporting session now for the working groups. So we're going to be bringing each of the working groups. So if you are actually a reporter for your working group, we'd like you to come backstage, okay? And you can tell. Some people can't tell the time, right? Okay, so we're going to get going, all right? So I'm going to hopefully be able to bring out the first presenter from the working group, and it's one of our own here at Appalachian. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Uh, our working group is the campus-based energy efficiency group. It's quite a large group. So those of you who have been here before know that we have subdivided our group into three subcategories or subgroups to keep it small enough to where the groups are manageable. Um, the first group is the subgroup on organizational effectiveness. Um, they're seeking to find ways to make all of our energy personnel, energy managers, energy analysts more effective and what makes one more effective than another. In that line, we have one of our folks that is, is still looking at um, the impact of how the energy personnel fit into the organizational structure and how that Im impacts their effectiveness. And that's an ongoing study. Um, but we also begin looking at, we've been talking about a lot of things for the last five years within our group. And we started thinking about before we reach for the you know, the brass ring, the, the top hanging fruit, we still have a lot of low hanging fruit, um, particularly when we look statewide. So we want to start quantifying the low hanging fruit that's still out there um, so that hopefully we can find ways to go ahead and, and capture those energy savings. Um, so we started asking ourselves, what, what would an effective energy manager, if all of our energy managers were, were equally effective, what kinds of things would they have be would they be doing like lighting like variable frequency drives also known as speed drives um, so we've got folks looking at that we're actually got folks who want to count the number of fan motors statewide above five horsepower that don't have a variable frequency drive or a speed drive on them we think there are thousands maybe tens of thousands the payback on installing a VFD on a fan motor that size on average is about 18 months. That's within the two year budget cycle. But we've got thousands that have not been done. We're gonna get a count of them. We're gonna find a way to get that done. Um, also, we have someone looking at street lighting, cobra heads, shoebox fixtures. How many do we have? We did a lot of them with the statewide lighting contract this past year. But how many do we still have left that are not done? We've got somebody who's going to research that, find out how many we have. And then um, we had somebody suggest that we've got hand dryers. You know, some of those hand dryers, you push a button and they come on and you walk out, you dry your hands, you walk out of the bathroom, they're still running. And they run after you've already left. That's a very inefficient system. How much could we save if we replaced all of the inefficient hand dryers with the sensor kind that stop running as soon as you move your hands? Somebody's going to investigate that and come back with some information to see if that's worth looking at. And then we've got um, a very big interest in converting all of the old outdated pneumatic controls with digital controls. That's a very expensive proposition. Could pro would probably be a lot less expensive if we can do it with wireless controls. Some of our uh, universities have already done that. We've got somebody looking at strategies, different strategies for doing that. Is wireless worth doing? Uh, we're looking at that. So that's something we're doing. Our subgroup on communication and best practices. Those members are doing a final review of, a, of a, an ECM list, an energy conservation measures list that can be disseminated to all over the state um, that will tell people what are the low-hanging fruit what what can you go out there and capture very easily um, they're also um, 
trying to do a bigger outreach with the listserv that we've talked about for many years that is a collaborative site for all of our energy um, per professionals around the state. We're going to do a re outreach to uh, community colleges again, try to get more of them involved and, and others as well. And then they're going to repost several important documents on that website. And then every one of the people in that group is going to try to post at least one thing that is either a warning about something you should avoid or watch out for or something positive that you should be doing. And then our subgroup on technical expertise, um, they're continuing. We, we actually already have a curriculum in place, I think, at Wake Tech um, to develop as we convert our buildings to digital. Mike O'Connor talked about the 90,000 pieces of data that are on this campus that are constantly reporting. Somebody has to maintain that. You have to know object-oriented programming if you're going to do that. You have to know um, a computer database management if you're going to do that. The problem we have, so now we've got this program, we're going to start having super techs graduating from this program. The problem is the private controls companies around the state are paying these folks sixty to eighty thousand dollars the minute they graduate from the program. Um, we lost one college student not too long back because the controls company offered them double the salary in a truck. How are we going to compete and actually get those people? Um, so they're they're looking at that. Salary is a big thing, but one of the things we're looking at, and I'm going to mention this. The reason we're trying to quantify some low-hanging fruit, or as uh, Lynn Hoy said a while ago, some slow rabbits. The reason we're trying to quantify that, if we could do another project, say replace all of the, or install speed drives on all of the fan motors statewide, could we then use the savings? How many of you know what 1292 is? Okay, 1292 is a, is a legal mechanism whereby you can take energy savings from your utility budget and convert it and use it for a different energy project okay so we thought if we can do an energy project like that produce some savings apply for 1292 be able to retain that money through 1292 maybe we could use some of those funds to hire some of these super techs in the university system so we got somebody looking at that that's an update on our, what our group is currently doing. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for coming back after the snack. Um, my name is Lee Ball. I'm the Interim University Sustainability Director here at Appalachian State. And myself and Jeff Ramsdell, uh, we facilitated the Academic Integration Working Group. And this year, we really focused on building community with, um, with these individuals that attended the group. Uh, we had a lot of faculty there. We had people from facilities and a handful of other places. But we really recognized that there are individuals and institutions that have a lot to offer. We have um, people that need help. And we have people also interested in uh, developing projects with one another. So we're really trying to be a catalyst to help um, support um, those efforts. We've developed a case study um, uh, uploader on our website for the Energy Summit. And if you go to the Energy Summit's website and then you go to the Academic Integration Working Group, you'll see a place where you can upload a case study where you're, where you're involved with um, some work related to academic integration. That's open to anybody. It doesn't have to be um, people from this particular working group. We invite anyone that's doing this type of work to upload um, examples of their projects so that we can all share. You know, the idea is that we're, you know, we, we don't have a lot of time you know, from what we're hearing and uh, it's all hands on deck and we really need to do this together and be, and be transparent and generous with, our, um, you know, with the work that we're doing with each other. So that was a real focus of this group. We're really excited for this afternoon to get back together. We're going to do a little bit of a speed dating activity where we're going to ask people to um, create one very meaningful relationship and maybe help someone or receive help or commit to doing a project together. So this is across campuses, you know, maybe potentially across states. 
Uh, and we have people here from all over the, you know, the, the country this year. So it's, it's very exciting to, to do this work. We have a lot to, to you know, still to do, um, but uh, this has been a place for us to, um, to get together and share and, and build this community and, and build trust with each other because we all have the same goal. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my pleasure to be able to report on the activities of the Finance and Regulatory Working Group. Um, as Miriam Tripp and I were assembling the agenda for our group, we said after five years of uh, plowing through these topics and opportunities, what are we going to talk about? Well, it sure didn't prove to be a problem. We had an absolutely wonderful group working with us, a uh, very diverse group with a lot of um, new ideas coming in. And so uh, the afternoon was very productive, and we took the full time to be able to uh, generate these activities. So I did want to report to you on uh, seven different areas of activities uh, that we're going to be taking on and give you a flavor of the types of things that we're looking forward to. One of our continuing efforts is, of course, to try to bring renewable energy to our campuses. And so Liz Bowen uh, is continuing to work with her, her group to be able to not only identify those opportunities, but then work on ways to deal with the financing and fundraising to be able to make those happen. Uh, likewise, um, I'm sure you realize that building automation is one of the keystones to our energy programs and being able to keep up with an industry that is changing very rapidly is quite a challenge. And so Steve Martin, uh, at uh, Pembroke is working with a group to be able to look at best practices for our building automation and to be able to share that information across all of our uh, UNC schools. I think um, as we begin to uh, push on these topics a lot more and issues of uh, cl climate change and global warming come up that are issues of being responsible citizens regard to greenhouse gases becomes even more important. And uh, Jeff Hightower with our group has been working with several of the campuses that have not completed inventories and perhaps uh, car carbon action plans to encourage them to do so, to uh, build on the experience of all of our other campuses and hopefully be able to get all of the campuses moving ahead with their carbon action plans. Next. Uh, as many of you know, a uh, number of years ago, House Bill 1292 was passed that provided an opportunity for us to be able to uh, retain utility surplus through carry forward if we could document energy programs that we had implemented with positive results. And so uh, this has been in place for a while. We feel that there are some um, strengthening that we can do to be able to produce more results from uh, the existing 1292. And so Phil Jones is going to be heading up a group to be able to draft uh, some legislation that we will work with GA on to be able to provide that strengthening. Likewise, uh, for the past couple sessions, we've had House Bill 245, which is called the Energy Freedom Act. And really, its key component is to be able to provide third-party sales, which will uh, definitely be a springboard for renewables on our campuses. And uh, that legislation is currently uh, housed in committee. We'd like to see it get moving there. And so Mike O'Connor and Logan Skarnowski are going to be able to um, put together a strategic plan for engaging a number of other groups on our campuses, our students, um, other uh, groups in like industries in K-12 and community colleges to be able to um, put pressure on our legislature to be able to advance that um, important bill. The last two items uh, really deal with uh, some of the things that are happening currently with us. And one of those things is the uh, bond program for the new buildings that were, were, uh, are now being designed and, and constructed uh, from the bond funds. As with the 2000 bond, this is a tremendous opportunity for us to be able to implement energy standards and to be able to um, make a positive contribution to the 
gains that we have already seen in terms of energy consumption. So Bill Bagnell uh, is going to develop uh, these energy benchmarks and standards as minimums for us to be able to attain with our designs and uh, that way we can ensure that these buildings will be making a positive contribution to our progress to date. Uh, likewise, Mar Miriam Tripp and Len Hoy are going to work with us to um, really solidify the water and energy reduction goals that we would like to put in place uh, out to 2025. And with the relaxation of some of the legislation uh, from Senate Bill 668, we feel like it's an important thing for the UNC system to make a commitment that carries on uh, those goals and uh, provides motivation for all of us to be able to continue with that good work. So uh, Len and Miriam will be putting that together and memorializing that information uh, so we can roll it out to the system. So I think you can see we've got, we got a very uh, rich agenda of things coming up and we're looking forward to making progress on all of these and uh, we'd appreciate your comments and sharing of information. Thank you. Jack just told me to break a leg. Um, my name is John Fields. Uh, I'm at East Carolina University. Um, I'm in the High Performance Campus Design Work Group. I wanted to first off thank everybody at App State and the sponsors and the hosts for an incredible um, experience. This is just for me has been almost cathartic. Um, I kind of got a, a shot of energy out of this as I usually do. Uh, in the, in the 10,000 things we all do in the course of a day, and I think everybody else did as well. Um, our, our work group, I also want to have to extend special thanks to Michelle Novacek. She, uh, she scribed for us, and my goodness, next year, I've got to have it. Make it be so, please, sir. Um, we had a very great, uh, very large spirited discussion in our work group yesterday. We had nine UNC system schools represented, uh, state construction, uh, the Department of Environmental Quality, University of Maryland, Florida State, three, three consultants. And so we had a lot of different diverse opinions about things that we could be working on. But what we talked about initially is uh, what's, what has happened, what have we done in the past, and what commitments have we made as a work group. So we need to sort of deliver on those things. And one of the things, um, glad to report is the best practices and sustainability, the guidelines for master planning, design and construction document uh, is under review at GA now and uh, will imminently be posted on the website for everybody's use. Um, that is a fantastic step and that completes the loop for all the great work that this committee did before my involvement, but it closes the loop on that item and it's just It'll be a fantastic resource for everybody across the system and anybody else that wants to uh, take a look at it. Uh, we also um, talked about uh, a variety of other things. And I'm just going to go through these, but we en ended up boring in deeper on several fronts because there was a recurring thing that kept coming through about building controls, building controls. It kept seeping into the conversation no matter what we were brainstorming. It came up over and over and over again, but we talked about uh, a couple of things that came up that were interesting. Uh, uh, a, a renovation of a dining hall, LEED certified, and three years later uses more energy than before. Uh, so there's, you know, some follow-up needed to analyze that, but you know, there's something not quite right with ha with that particular situation. But again, it, it speaks to the vigilance of uh, being able to get accurate information on energy use in your buildings over time. Um, we all felt like the our that the operations and maintenance staff needed more training for high performance buildings because they are very complex. And what, one of the things that came out of our conversation was we, we all thought in, at the end of the day that 
control systems are too complex and they don't have to be as complex as they are. Um, and so it's something that we, we may want to take a look at in the future. It's going to be on our list of things to, to uh, take on in the future. Um, we also looked at what's, you ever heard value engineering? Anybody ever heard that? It's an oxymoron. Um, you know, it, by the time you're value engineering, if you're doing it, you've, the ship sailed, you're cutting things. And so what's the first thing that typically goes? Most everybody sees um, things that, that might be optional, not vital to the program, uh, but sustainable practices. And so how, you know, focus on what we can do to change that in the future. And from my perspective, um, I spoke a little bit about this last year, it's um, getting more detailed design earlier in the design process to give your designer and your construction manager more information to estimate. So get that detail earlier, but that needs to be fleshed out in some way, but that will help that process, no, in my mind, uh, because you don't want to get, if you get, uh, you end up with value engineering in the end, you kind of miss something early, in my personal opinion. Um, so how can we do better? Uh, energy uh, conservation measures, um, we think it's, and we've been talking with Jerry Marshall's group we did last year, we met together and talked about that, uh, and on how important it is for us to share that information that is submitted to um, Lynn Hoy and Renee Hutchinson um, in under House Bill 1292 for uh, energy carry forward. So what are the 10,000 things that are out there that one campus is doing, maybe the other's not. I ask an example I saw yes, uh, in looking at a previous list last year was NC State had captured the energy savings from re-roofing a building. That an ECM, you don't normally think of it, but it's, you know, it's a little bit and it adds to the aggregate of our, to minimize our, our avoid costs. So, uh, and no one in the room had heard that. So the importance of sharing the ECMs is that it, um, it will, we can take what someone did and multiply it geometrically. Um, the real meat of our conversation really dealt with working on simplifying building controls. Um, and, and then the, uh, the whole question of maintaining all the control, the thousands and thousands of control points that feed the building control systems in a building and how do you maintain all those thousands and thousands of points and do we have time to do it and then we start thinking about well what if uh, you're in a hot healthcare environment where the joint commission requires you to document all those things it's, it's a different kind of environment in healthcare versus academia but but you know garbage in garbage out if you have a foul data point feeding your energy management system then you, you're you're not getting a true picture of what's going on don't have an answer we just identified it as an issue Completion of buildings, uh, we talked about what's the real value, uh, or let me back up. Has, has anybody here ever moved into a building wasn't quite finished? Not everybody? Well, uh, you know, unfortunately we're on the business end of having to open buildings sometimes when classes need to start. And it's not by choice that we do these things sometimes. But how do we do something on the front end of the project to be able to, um, put a, val a proper valuation on the completion of the building, if you will, in the schedule of values for a project. We're, we decided that's something we could all work on together and really sink our teeth into and produce something uh, possibly by the mid-year summit that would be helpful to the whole group. So we're gonna take that on and work on it. Um, so um, we talked about common design standards and whether that's possible um, we talked about uh, how about buildings that haven't been commissioned in years or maybe never were commissioned. Do we have our, you know, this dollar is just flying out the window, but we don't have the resources on the front end to be able to, um, to be able to go in and uh, uh, do the commissioning on those buildings. But there's a life cycle payback to it. So we just have, and some NC State, Chapel Hill have some good programs and others, I'm sure, but somehow we have to address that. And I think. There's opportunity there for co huge cost avoidance in the future. So that said, we had 
a very lively group. Um, and I tell you, it was uh, just great being in the room with a, a bunch of big brains, if you will, um, that were thinking about how to make campus design and construction more effective for the greater good. Thank you. Hello, my name is Heather Brutz and I work for the North Carolina Clean Energy Technology Center out of NC State University. And I was helping to manage the transportation working group this year. Um, and so the main goal that we had um, for this year for the transportation working group was essentially to decide and finalize on metrics that we were going to use to measure our baseline um, progress and be able to use that to measure um, improvements that we make going into the future. And so before the working group started, we um, gathered some data on fuel use from, from many of the participating schools. And then we looked at those metrics during the working group and decided if those were the ones that we wanted to continue um, using. And so we are going to continue to, we decided to go into more detail in certain categories. And so um, some of the things, some of the changes we decided to make are we are going to, um, instead of simply measuring um, tons of greenhouse gas emissions overall, we're going to be splitting them up into categories by fleet, transit, and then leased vehicles. Um, and there are some reasons for doing that. Um, it allows us to essentially look at the different changes in different categories and measure them with more nuance. So for example, if a university um, increases its transit service, um, that could be a potential increase in that category, but that's something that we want to encourage because we want to encourage alternative modes of transportation. Um, and so we wanted to be able to measure that with more granularity. Um, in addition to going and measuring greenhouse gas emissions, we decided that we wanted to also measure petroleum displacement and look at the amount of gasoline and diesel that we are not, uh, that we are saving through the changes we're making. Um, and we also decided that we wanted to, um, on the greenhouse gas emissions side, compare the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that we are doing in comparison to a business as usual scenario where we are using no alternative fuels um, and we're using all gasoline and diesel. And so those are going to be metrics that we're going to be reporting out on in the future. Um, additionally, um, in the fleet manager, because we have two subgroups, we have the fleet managers group and the community transportation group. In the fleet managers group, we did decide that we were going to recirculate the metrics sheet that we had sent around beforehand with the updated metrics to go and try to get more complete data on the fiscal year that just ended so that we can have a, more um, a, a better baseline next year to go and measure progress against. Um, and so on the fleet manager side, some of the other things that we discussed in addition to the discussion of metrics, we had Zach McLawhorn from Motor Fleet Management from the Department of North Carolina Department of Administration come and talk to us about some of the alternative fuel options that are available through Motor Fleet and also had some discussion of essentially like coordination between um, Motor Fleet and the universities. Um, and he also agreed to go and help with um, providing fuel usage data on the leased vehicles from Motor Fleet. Um, we also, um, in a, and then we also had um, in the, on the indirect emissions side, so fuel usage is direct greenhouse gas emissions, many of the greenhouse gas emissions from transportation in our universities are indirect from commuter travel. And so those emissions are dealt with more in the community transportation um, subgroup of the transportation group that looks at transportation demand management, public transportation, biking, walking, carpooling, all of those things. And in that subgroup, they had some discussions where they shared best practices. Um, there was a lot of discussion on services that help to facilitate car sharing, um, carpooling, and um, 
and also um, essentially like joint bicycle and walking trips. Um, and Amanda Simmons from UNC Chapel Hill talked about how um, Chapel Hill is using Share the Ride and see um, and the services that they provide that help facilitate um, carpooling and also they have services where um, people can essentially sign up to do bicycle commutes together if they want to go, if they don't want to do it alone, um, or walking commutes if they don't want to do it alone. Um, and then there was also a lot of discussion about bike sharing, um, which is of interest to many of the universities here. And so bike sharing are essentially programs where you can um, often by the hour rent a bike and um, pick it up in a station and possibly ride it over to a different part of campus and return it there. Um, and so um, the staff discussed a lot of the logistics around um, implementing a bike share. Uh, Diane Ward, who runs the um, Charlotte um, B-Cycle um, bike share, talked about some of the logistics that they have faced in Charlotte um, with implementing their bike share. Um, and so some of the logistical issues that were discussed in the community transportation group around bike share included essentially like how do you set the rental prices, how long can people rent them for, where do you put the stations, um, what types of bikes do you need, what sorts of maintenance um, do they require. Um, and so people shared their experiences on that topic as well. Um, this afternoon, um, we plan on continuing discussion of bike share um, and also electric vehicles um, in the group, um, as well as having some discussion around um, driver training to go and promote fuel, safe and fuel efficient driving practices. Um, so that is what we did this year, and thank you for coming. how short you really are, step up to the mic. <laughs> How's everyone doing? My name is Jen Maxwell and I work here at Appalachian um, in the sustainability office. Um, I'm going to just talk to you a little bit about the new group. I have the pleasure of leading the New Zero Waste group and this is the first year that this working group has been formed. Um, you know, this is a really important addition to the Energy Summit, not only because of the relationship to energy and waste and climate change, but because if you take a look across your campuses at some of the grassroots efforts that have happened, um, you can certainly find that even in the mid to late 80s, there were waste reduction and recycling offices and staff who were doing a lot of work toward sustainability. Um, you know, there's many collaborative efforts from faculty, students, and staff that originated with those offices, and so that's a real important um, historical and institutional knowledge that really needs to be recognized. And so I'm really thankful that we are now part of this group and the discussion is there. Um, so we had a really dynamic group yesterday, about 25 people. And um, we spent some time with conversations around several different topic areas. Um, we had zero waste and campus planning. So really trying to take a look at upstream strategies and, and what campuses are doing to move towards zero waste. Um, Composting was a big um, discussion area, and everybody had the opportunity, we did roundtable discussions, everyone had the opportunity to move around from subject to subject, and um, at some points it was almost difficult to get people to move on to the next subject because they were in such so deep conversations, so that was really interesting but great to see. Um, we did special recycling, so different waste streams and, and issues that you might have on your campuses. Um, green events, greening athletics were a couple other topics, and then education and outreach, which is always a really big one. Um, so today, we'll kind of move on to a conversation cafe around ro the road to zero waste and stumbling blocks and collaboration stories. So we'll have more of an open discussion with the entire group, so really looking forward to that. Um, I wanted to take a minute, speaking of zero waste, just to thank, um, just to say this was a zero waste event, and it takes a lot of behind the scenes work. So I really wanted to point out, we have um, many students in our office that we hire for education and outreach and um, efforts. And so we had a team of wonderful student and former students who stepped up and worked really hard to make this a zero waste event. So if you would give them a round of applause, I really appreciate it. <laughs> so 
Thank you. You know, the conversations that are happening in, in these meetings and are so important because I think when those conversations happen and you're networking and you're sharing, that's really where the action happens. And so take that back when you leave here and, and continue those conversations. Contact those people that you met while you're here. And we look forward to seeing you again next year. Thanks. Hello again. My name is Max Trelerny, and I am again with the University of South Carolina. So, I've been given the chance today to talk about the Student Summit and what I gained from it. This has been a very impromptu speech, so please forgive me for any mistakes I make, and please, if you can help me out by laughing at my jokes this time, I would really appreciate it. <laughs> this is my first year at the conference. And it's been a wonderful experience. I have met so many people, talked with so many professionals, and had just a wonderful time. It's been truly amazing and awe-inspiring. If sustainability is simply people working together to create a society that can continue endlessly, then this summit has succeeded. I've been able to talk to so many people, to so many students, and make so many close friends. First of which is Cynthia Olson the student director for this event. I first spoke with her, or at least emailed her, to talk about my speech as I applied to speak here. And ever since I got on campus and started working with her to figure out what I was doing and when, she has only been helpful and so sincere to me, and I'm so appreciative to that. A second person I've met that's been really influential to me has been Steven Tolovich. This kid is from the University of UNC Chapel Hill, excuse me. Yeah. Um, and he's, he's been fun to speak with. I met him the first night at dinner. We talked about just so many things, and he was a great person to be around. He was so positive and so helpful. What amazes me, though, is I thought I was young. I'm only 20 years old. This guy's 19. He's a teenager still out here making a name for himself. It's so impressive to me that he's taken such a large step so early on in his life. Finally, I met this duo from Western Carolina this morning while we were talking at his posters, 7 a.m., bright and early, trying to stumble out of bed, figure out what to talk about, and get judged on what we're doing back at our university. They were a great resource to me. They were so friendly and so much fun to be around, and they have great ideas. First up is Isaac Hayes who is working on making this net zero energy building, a research facility that UNC uses, I believe. He has these great ideas on how to use carbon sequestration from planting 20, or having, buying 55 acres of trees. And also just working on building maintenance and simple light switching, to all to make this net zero building. What he is trying to accomplish is truly astounding to me. The second person I met was Bryson Shannon, again from Western Carolina. And he's working with solar panels, but more specifically working on these bent solar panels so that they use more light, or at least take advantage of more light of the day because solar angles change as we go from dawn to dusk. This innovative thinking, I think, is truly inspirational and is one of the purposes of this summit. I've also had the chance to make some great professional connections, chief among which is Ivan Erlov from the NCSEA. He's someone I really look up to in this brief moment that I met him, and someone I aspire to be. He was on the forefront of the policy that got the North Carolina Renewable Energy Portfolio Standards passed. This is something that South Carolina really needs to work on and has great room for improvement. And I hope that I can one day be much like Ivan and help pass that in South Carolina. A second person I've met with is Sandy Skoloshenko from the North Carolina Division of Environmental Quality. She works all across the state working on recycling and getting people to work together and see the importance and recycle. While this isn't exactly what I want to do, 
I see the importance of working with these people and getting them to buy into these sustainability habits. That's what I'm doing with Green Office Certification. And what she's doing is something that inspires me and I hope to connect with her and also Ivan in the future as I figure out where I go in the future with my professional career. I have the chance to host the Green Networking Breakfast and the Green Career Fair at USC. This is a chance for professionals to come meet the students at USC. And I've been so impressed with all the people here today. We really struggle to get businesses outside of Columbia proper to come to this meeting. But we have one of the best international business programs in the nation and a great business program and a great environmental science program. And I would love to extend to all of you, the sponsors, the, the businesses, to please reach out to me. We would love to have you. We have great students down there. They want to talk with you. They want to find solutions to our problems. And I think Columbia is a great resource for that. And if you all, again, would love to connect with me, I'll be around. You can find me on the app. I'd appreciate that. One of the biggest takeaways I have from this summit is the structure. What we do at USC with professional development and with student engagement is very, very widespread. What the summit is able to do is bring together these factors along with networking opportunities and speakers, wonderful speakers, all under one roof in one brief meeting. That's amazing. It gives students the full picture and the full opportunity to make the most of their life and their careers. That's something I want to take back to what I do on USC. This summit has given me the opportunity to connect with so many unique individuals, all with a different idea on how to be sustainable and what that means. I was talking with Cynthia and her friend Amy, and they approve of the idea of minor conflict being a way to start discussions and to start conversations and to reach agreements, and I completely agree. I was talking with another friend, Logan Samuelson, who talked to me about GMO corn and how it's all the same thing up and down the rows, all unique, or excuse me, all exact identical to one another. We can't be that, we have to disagree, we need to talk, we need to communicate. And that's what the summit is providing, a chance to share our ideas all under the same, the same umbrella of sustainability. That's so vital, I believe. One thing I struggle with is being negative. I have this overwhelming positive feel for everything and anything that bad that happens, I just smile and nod and, and wish, wish it away. I can't do that though. I've had professors at USC provide uh, lectures about the negative aspects of things and I need to understand the importance of thinking about the negative impacts. We need to have an agenda. We need to be, we need to have these priorities, these, these reasons and having a negative, understanding the importance of a negative outlook is very vital for that. And Bill McKimmon's speech really spoke to me on that and I believe is really sticking with me. This is my takeaway from the summit. All these ideas, all these students, all these businesses working together with one goal with these different ideas. My last shout out comes from the activity feed for the app from Christopher Frisente. I've not met this person, but he had a great quote online. He said, it could have been called an expo. It could have been called a conference, but it's called a summit. We have to climb for knowledge. This is a great quote, I believe, and it's very applicable. I have reached the peak of my professional, of my social, and of my intellectual being, I guess. I've talked with more people than ever. I have made more friends in such a short time, and I've learned so much, and it's great. But Boone is not Mount Everest. As I drive home today to go back home, I'll fall down this peak some. I'll go into this valley. But as I get back to school and talk with my friends, my cohorts, I want to start that trek up Mount Everest, or at least Mount Olympia. That's what I've gained from this conference, the, from this summit, excuse me, the ability to talk, to disagree, to work together for this end goal. So thank you. I also want to say thank you to the sponsors and the donors that have put on this event. We as students and everyone else in the audience are so grateful for what you do to make this conference free for someone like me in South Carolina. It's a great opportunity and I hope more people can come. The volunteers, the hosts organize this event. It's so well structured, it's so amazing. And again, I'm so grateful. So thank you again.